Um, so my name is Esther De Leon. I am an associate librarian for the College of Media Communication at Texas Tech University Libraries. Um, I am a graduate of the of Lubbock Christian University with a Bachelor's of Arts and Humanities with a minor in Spanish and a graduate of University of North Texas in Denton with a Master's in Library Science. Um, my interests include the anthropological historical aspects of Hispanic Latino culture and heritage, literature and identity. I currently serve as the Leaders Engaged in Advancing Diversity Fellow for the Diversion of, Division of Diversity and Representative of the Libraries. Um, I'm the member of the Mexican American Latino Studies Working Group, advisor for the Unidos por un mismo idioma, UMI, and currently have begun this project, the Chicana X Latina X Working Group, along with my colleague Karina Carmona. That, um, and the group serves to continue research and create dialogue on the influence of Chicana and Latina feminisms. Uh, Karina Carmona is my co-PI for the group working group. She's originally from the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, is an artist and an art educator. She received her bachelor's in fine art at the University of Texas Pan American and has a master's in art education from Texas Tech University. Currently, Karina has been focusing on her time as a PhD candidate in the fine arts doctoral program at TTU. Her research area focuses on local history and critical and cultural expression within the arts and Mexican American studies. Britta Anderson is in her first year at Texas Tech as an assistant professor of Spanish in the Department of Classical and Modern Literatures and Languages. Her research and teaching interests include border studies, public art, queer theory, performance, and Latinx and Mexican literature. She completed a PhD in Hispanic literature and language at Washington University in St. Louis in 2016 with a certificate in women, gender, and sexuality studies. She served as the director of the Latin American Studies Center at the University of Maryland from 2017 to 2019. Brita has published articles on the work of Helena Maria Veramontes, Cecilia Vincuña, Mexican feminist hip hop group Batallones Femeninos, and performance art at the US Mexican border. Her community engagement has included accompaniment and interpretation services for asylum seekers and tutoring with the Washington University Prison, Prison Education Project. Cordelia E. Barrera is an associate professor of English and co-director of the Literature of Social Justice and Environment, LSJE, initiative at Texas Tech University. She earned a PhD at the University of Texas at San Antonio and specializes in Latinx literatures, the American Southwest, and multi-ethnic specul speculative fiction. Her publications have appeared in the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, Western American Literature, and Chicana Latina Studies, the Journal of MALCS. Dr. Barrera's work highlights the need to disrupt mythologies of the American West by incorporating border voices and identities and concentrates on the literature of social justice and environment. Her current book project, The Haunted Borderlands, explores space, place, and the politics of haunting in the American Southwest. And that, last but not least, Leticia M. Delgado is a costume designer and educator. She has been Ballet Lubbock's costume designer production assistant since summer of 2016. Leticia balances her duties at Ballet Lubbock with an academic career. She currently teaches at Lubbock Christian University and has previously held professorships with Miami University, Miami University, Ball State University, and the University of California, Santa Barbara. Leticia's costumes have appeared in various local venues and on stages across the country from the Illinois Shakespeare Festival to the Santa Barbara Theater Group and have toured internationally to China and Ireland with the Santa Barbara Dance Theater. Some of Mrs. Delgado's costume work is included in the director's vision, play direction from analysis to production. And Leticia contributed to, chapter, to a chapter in costume design textbook, The Art and Practice of Costume Design in uh, 2017. She received her MFA in costume design and technology from the School of Theater in Illinois State University. Leticia is a member of the United States Institute for Theater Technology and Associate for Theater and Higher Education. Okay, so um, from here we'll discuss um, Chicana. Uh, Karina, do you want to speak a little bit about Chicana and Latina? Well, the, the title of our group? Yes, so um, we decided to um, choose the titles uh, Chicanx and Latinx uh, based on, um, <clears throat> this group was based on a reading group that the Women uh, and Gender Studies program put together um, last fall and the, the previous fall of 2018. Um, 
<clears throat> and I um, wanted it to be based on Chicana feminism. Um, a lot of those readings from that group, um, which was postponed and then it kind of uh, um, just didn't have, uh, it didn't happen, but, uh, <clears throat> but I really wanted to take those readings and center a working group around those important texts. And uh, the thing that prompted me to think about, uh, to kind of broaden the, the term out, outside of Chic Chicana was uh, Sherry Muraga talking about her latest book um, <clears throat> where she was thinking about where is Chicana feminism now, today, in the this new millennium. And um, so those are some of the things that I thought about. And of course, you have to broaden the, the term to Latinx. You know, there's a lot of Latinas that don't identify as Chicana, whose work are just as critical. And um, so we wanted to, to still center it on Chicana feminism, but expand it beyond that, um, sort of like a pan Latinidad, and, um, but still stay central and true to Chicana feminism. And um, <clears throat> now the reason why we chose the, tr the X at the end, um, there's different, in different fields, the X may mean something different in, in my, <clears throat> particular field, which is uh, visual studies or art history, um, the X in Chicanx, Latinx meant for um, artists or, you know, artists that are based in the U.S. And uh, at least in the art world, there's a real lack of representation of U.S.-based artists. And, um, and a lot of the times, Latinx, Chicanx um, people, um, artists, you know, um, people in uh, look, trying to get tenure, people trying to get jobs, trying to get that representation, get passed over time and time again. And um, so that's, that's sort of for in my, my context in the art world, that's where the X comes in. And I know that it's a whole lot more complicated in different areas. Like if you're part of the Latinx Scholars Facebook group, you know that, you know the what the Latinx term um, uh, means there, and it could mean different things. This is just to be more inclusive, to be more in the think about uh, in the twenty first century. And of course, it uh, is supposed to mean to be inclusive of all genders, right? To kind of get away from that gender binary, and um, but it's also a very new term. It's a very new term that is being used um, and not a lot of people like it, you know, and, and, and again, it depends on the context and it's in, di in different fields um, from different perspectives. People may see it differently, but this is why we chose to use Chicanx, Latinx, and, um, and yeah, so I hope that answers or that kind of paints the picture for that. And then um, our intentions for the group were to create like a semi-supportive, it's like half supportive, half like let's get together and let's work and let's collaborate um, among people who either identify as Chicana and or who were influenced by uh, Chicana feminism um, um, and uh, correct. I think um, we want to help in this, since we're an HSI um, institution now, um, we want to help bring the awareness, the consciousness, you know, that it's not just Latinos, that, that we have a space to, um, Karina, did I kind of cover that? <laughs> Watch Lee. So, um, yeah, we wanted the working group was, you know, we, we wanted to create a safe space for anyone that was, anybody, it could be open to anybody that is influenced by Chicana, fem Chicana or Latina feminisms. Um, <clears throat> and to have a space where we could talk about our research, talk about our curriculum, talk about our experiences, um, you know, and uh, have support for each other and then dedicate our time to 
to sit there and talk about our research, talk about our, our job prospects, you know, try to, you know, um, and, and this is supposed to be students, staff, and community members. So <clears throat> that's sort of the idea of it. And it's, a, it's also meant to be a part of the grant is that it's part, it's supposed to be interdisciplinary. So we have um, all walks of life coming and together. So um, um, in, within the group. Okay, so we'll start with our first, um, I guess, uh, statement or question. And uh, the panelists, you may answer in whatever order. Um, but the first one is, uh, you will discuss identifying as a Chicana or with Chicanas and or Chicana feminism. So that's your first um, thing, so. Um, I guess I'll jump in <laughs> since we're probably short on time. Um, I'm um, Cordelia Barrera and uh, thank you very much Esther for uh, introducing me. Uh, I am in the Department of English and I regularly teach um, uh, multi-ethnic literature or Latina literature um, and, and the American Southwest. And in doing that, what I very often try to do is marry uh, works that um, interrogate frontier Western spaces uh, alongside uh, borderland spaces, really um, looking at the frontier through the lens of the borderlands or border theory to open up those um, conversations. Um, and as far as identifying as uh, Latina or Chicana, I am, I am a 10th generation Tejana. And I mostly identify as, 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 as a Tejana, I would say. Um, but Chicana feminism factors into everything that I do. Um, whenever I begin a project, it's rare for me not to begin with Gloria Anzaldúa or uh, Emma Perez or Chela Sandoval or um, Shuri Muraga. And I do this um, especially because um, Anzaldúa and, and, and all Chicana scholars really um, discuss how multi-ethnic subjects um, straddle at least two cultures. Um, and how this uh, is not just a physical borderland that very often we find ourselves struggling uh, with, um, but also those psychical, those spiritual, those um, emotional uh, borders that keep us separated. Um, and so it's this idea of how do we balance the duality of the many aspects of ourselves in ways that don't further marginalize um, or fragment identity, um, but maybe work towards deconstruction of identity so as to reconstruct that identity based in value systems um, that and again, the deconstruction comes because very often there is a need to deconstruct aspects of identity because they're based very often identities that are um, on the surface are based in value systems that, have, that we've inherited from the status quo, let's say, um, or the dominant culture. And so how do we address ways of dismantling these ideas and then reforming them, not just to do something, not just to reform the self in terms of difference, but in a way that's transformative. And part of the reason that I very often look to Anzaldúa and, and that um, I, 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 I generally call my students to, to, to take a very, uh, uh, 
a deep look into into her work is because her work is very visionary and 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 um, revolutionary. She wants us to change, and and many Chicanas like Anzaldúa who follow in those in those same paths. Um, the way we look at our world, the way we look at ourselves. Um, and so I think it's those transformative revolutionary ideals that Chicana feminism holds at its core that really speak to me. And that's what I try to get across to my students. How can they take those ideas and kind of work through aspects of themselves that they've either been uh maybe uh um that they've maybe uh felt that they that they have maybe felt ashamed of or that they have maybe felt have needed to be kind of pushed to some edge how do we gain back those aspects of the self mm -hmm. Rita or Letty? Sure. Um, well, first, big thank you to Kent and the whole team who made this happen for your adaptability. Um, I'm really happy to still be able to participate via Zoom. And big thank you to Corina and Esther um, for their work in organizing all year long. Um, regarding the question of identifying as Chicana with Chicanas or uh, Chicana feminism, um, I am not Chicana, but the greatest teachers in my life have been through books, classroom instruction, and various community experiences. I think that I am very much formed by the Hispanic neighborhood, culture, and history that I grew up surrounded by in New Mexico. And so coming here for my first year at Tech, I was thrilled to find a space really dedicated to honoring and the wisdom and knowledge stemming from Chicana feminism. Um, second, I think that Chicana feminism for me really exceeds the textual. It is an embodied community-based practice that insists on the inclusion of the personal within the theoretical. And so as a white ally committed to the success and the celebration of the excellence of our Chicana and Latinx community. Um, it's important to me more than anything within this group to listen and to learn from the wide range of experiences and identities represented in our group and on our campus. Um, and then to leverage the institutional access that my whiteness affords me to amplify these contributions and to further connect our, our Latinx community with opportunities and, and resources. As an HSI, I think that that is the responsibility of everyone at Tech, um, and it's one that I take seriously. Um, in addition, I believe that Chicana feminism has always been intersectional. You know, since its origins in the 1980s with the writings of lesbian Chicana powerhouses, Gloria Anzaldúa and Charity Moraga, and really well before that with the activism of young Chicana women in the Brown Berets, in the Chicano movement, as well as in the um, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atlan in the 1960s, Chicano feminism has, to me, always seen the world through an intersectional lens, well before Kimberly Kenshaw gave a name to the term or to the practice of accounting for the intersections and overlapping oppressions emerging um, from the identity categories of class, race, gender, sexuality, and other variables. Um, and Zeldua's concept of, of mestiza consciousness or of the, the generative potential of navigating the complexities of multiple identities and communities at once um, shaped my early understanding of my own sexual and gender identity. Uh, and I think her writings really invited me into the field of Chicana feminism as an intersectional, experiential, embodied, and community-based practice and inquiry. Um, I'm going to try to put in the, quote, in the chat here a quote that I found at like age 14 from Anzal Dua that just really clicked and much to, as um, Professor Barrera was speaking to, really did help me navigate a lot of the dualities 
that I was facing in, in figuring out my own identity and, and my place in my own community. Um, and I guess what, just one more point that I would add to uh, Corina and Esther's discussion of, of their decision to include the X within um, the, the naming of this group and to me within what Chicana feminism um, means is, sorry, um, was that, it, you know, coming to tech first semester and seeing the poster for this working group, it meant a lot to me to see that X included um, within a group committed to discussing these identities and conversations. Um, it meant a lot to me to see like a group of people thinking intentionally about inclusion and gender identity um, as the responsibility of all spaces on campus, not just the purview of, you know, the Office of LGBTQIA engagement. Um, yeah, I'll end there and, and pass to, to the next speaker. Letty. Mm -hmm. I think you're on mute still. All right. Okay. Um, I also wanted to thank everybody for giving us this opportunity to discuss these things um, with each other on this forum, considering uh, what the times are at this moment. Um, so being a Chicana to me became very relevant. Uh, I grew up in El Paso, Texas. Um, not necessarily in what we call the barrio, but definitely not in the rich side of town. Um, I came to Chicanismo through teatro, through theater. Um, looking at performances in El Paso at various high schools and middle schools when I was growing up, I noticed that there was a specific voice in the barrio that was being um, promulgated in certain schools, but not in other schools. Being very strange, considering that El Paso is predominantly um, Mexican-American, Latino, there are other uh, there's Puerto Ricans and Cubans and what have you, but I did notice the strong voice and performance of self in those particular schools in the barrios. And um, it was actually, it was a Shakespeare with a twist. It was Julieta and Romeo, right? And they were in the barrio and I was looking at this and I was about 13 years old with my dad. And I found it very fascinating because it was the first time, even though I had been in performance, where I saw my voice. Also, in the use of this standardized, excuse this, um, I do lots of Shakespeare myself as a designer, um, this dead white guy, right? But the voice being the universal voice of Romeo and Juliet and love and all those things that come with it. Um, as I was going through high school, I did lots of uh, university interscholastic league stuff. And I did primarily at that time, um, for some people, lots of Sandra Cisneros. Right, and lots of African American poets, uh, great poets, and Maya Angelou and what have you, and poetry and prose and stuff. And then I started kind of cultivating my knowledge of um, Chicanas, Latinas, women of power, uh, powerful voices of various um, realms, um, not necessarily just poets and playwrights, uh, but try, I was trying to look for, I'm like, do I see a uh, Chicana Latina judge, do I see, you know, looking at movies, always trying to look for myself, right? Or my fellow uh, Chicanas, Latinas uh, in that picture. So then I just continued on that path looking at um, Chicano theater. And in Chicano theater, when you look at one of the first um, really preeminent uh, books by Jorge Huerta, it's community right? It's inclusion of self and everyone. Now, um, the Chicano theater movement has lots of things when we look at Luis Valdez and Teatro Campesino, where it was not always, you know, very friendly to females. Um, and so I just think that it's very important to have the X to include everyone, because being people who have been sectioned off and cornered and silenced, I think it is important for us to give voice to everyone. And everybody lives in that border. We're all always um, struggling with, should I say that? Should I not say that? Should I put on, you know, should I code switch now? Should I say hola or que tal or maybe not? How are you? Um, and being Chicana means being able to bring the voice that you want to the forefront. And for me as a designer, it is very fascinating 
to look at, um, and also as an educator, to walk into a classroom and see or a design meeting at a very prominent Shakespeare festival and see the reaction when people say, oh, wow, she's Mexican, or oh, wow. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean to them? And what does that mean to me? I try to always put my best face forward. And sometimes it's in English, sometimes it's in Spanish, and I just do what I have to do. Um, and it is this strange thing. I appreciate this. Um, group very much so because it allows people of the community. I work for Ballet Lubbock, right? That is my primary job. I am an adjunct at LCU. Um, so I don't always, you know, coincide or go into the tech world. I do sometimes with my husband. He's a professor uh, in the School of Theater there. Um, but not always do I get to speak to other women of color or allies who are doing the same things that I am doing on a regular basis, thinking about more than just the self, but the self and the greater good for everybody else, right? Because that's really what happens when you're thinking about the community and trying to put the best face forward of everyone and accepting and listening and what have you. Okay. Um, and so you guys have um, kind of covered a little bit with what you've said on these next two points. So I'm gonna group them together and then you guys can um, speak to however you wanna to speak to these last two um, sections. So, um, and these last two uh, statements are belonging, uh, the panelists will discuss belonging to and the significance of the Chicana X Latina X working group. Also the importance of the working group and how um, and or how Chicano feminism is important in their research and or uh, discipline. And we can do this conversation style, we could do this. And go, Britta. Well, I mean, to me, one of the most crucial components of this working group is the creation of protected work time um, in community for women and people of color, particularly, which is a population disproportionately asked to do service work at academic institutions, right? So this space, um, this group creates a space where one, we just sit down and work together, um, but two, where we're listening to each other as powerful and capable and um, taking each other seriously as scholars and as experts. So, so that route to collaboration and sharing of resources just by, by physically and regularly sharing space together. Um, second, I think that this group really models the idea of Chicano feminism as not just theory, but as practice, as a lived embodied experience. Right by, by reading together and then using our readings of these cortex as a means of sharing personal experiences. Um, I, every time I, I've been able to come to the meetings, I'm really impressed by the vulnerability of the group members and people's willingness to, to share uh, their own life experiences. And so I really, when we read Borderlands, you know, I see um, those, those words being a, a point of departure for putting theory into practice and for um, people in the room to, um, to actually integrate the personal and the intimate into academic spaces. And I think that that is something that still, we, there's still a lot of work to be done on the legitimization and inclusion of the personal within academia. And especially for making room for emotional responses and lived experiences of minority communities within an institution. Um, you know, even, even Gloria Zaldúa was, in her moment of first publishing, was not taken seriously as an academic. When, when Borderlands first came out with a um, kind of peripheral press, because she wove her personal voice and her poetry into the articulation of her theory. So I think that what we do in the group by, by using our readings of, of theory and these texts in order to share about our personal lives is actually really a huge contribution. Um, so I'm grateful for, for the opportunity 
in, in this space to listen to, to my group mates, about, get real about what life at Tech and in Lubbock is like for them, um, and to, to witness how these readings function as points of departure for articulating and understanding more personal or interior aspects of people's lives and identities. Um, you know, I think that it is crucial for underrepresented groups uh, to have spaces on campus that are for and by them. And I, I do consider the primary function of this working group as serving and supporting our Chicana and Latinx constituents. Um, at the same time, I think that everyone has something to learn from Chicana feminism and from being in, in community with the particip powerful participants in this group. Um, and so I think that that can be a point of departure for everyone at Texas Tech to begin to see the ways in which we all benefit from being an HSI. Um, I think that we should all take Latinx and Chicana cultures and literatures um, seriously and that the white that white allyship in these, these conversations or within this group can mean um, being a respectful visitor within space texts or, or spaces that maybe aren't, aren't primarily for you. Um, and finally, I would just add on, on that point of, of what the working group has meant or how it's contributed. Um, I, I'm really struck by the interdisciplinarity of the group. We, we come from many different departments, experiences, professional trainings, literature, education, costume design, visual art, translation, uh, library science. Um, and, you know, I think it's rare and, and extremely valuable to, to share space with people who, who look at things differently from me, who have a different methodology or tool set for understanding the world. I think the symposium is one example of that, but um, within academic spaces, I think it takes some intentionality to create those interdisciplinary spaces. And I think that this group fulfills one of the main roles of a working group to, to really open the door to, to interdisciplinary um, collaboration and, and exchange. Um, yeah. Cordelia or Letty? Um, yeah, I'll jump in here. I, I, I echo everything uh, Britta um, uh, uh, says. Um, Trisha asked the question um, uh, if we've, uh, in as a part of this group, if we've thought about next steps. And we have had some discussion about these next steps. And I think it, it, it begins with what Britta has, has, has been talking about. The idea that we um, are given a space, we have a space in which our voices can be heard, in which we feel free to um, not only um, have our very unique voices heard, but witness as others um, who have very unique experience and voices are able to share their experiences and voices because sometimes this is this is the um, this is the end point for people where they do not imagine that they even have that space in which to in which to have the freedom to actually not just speak their mind but um, visualize how we can transform or continue to transform our own work, um, the work that we do for our students so that students can better understand how they can change their lives. Yeah, and this is what I think Chicana feminisms do, do very, very pointedly is force us to, very often in these forms of testimonio, force us to look very closely at those really, really painful aspects of our experience, uh, whether that's social or culture, cultural or personal or related to sexuality, and take those experiences and move them from this place where quite possibly we've, 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 We've had to, by necessity sometimes, keep them hidden. So to first have that space to be able to share that is, is, is the first step. 
and then also to make sure that our students um, understand that they too can take these spaces in the classroom, feel as though they are in a position to not only witness what other students have experienced and have learned and what they know, but maybe that will give them that small seed of confidence that they've been lacking to dig deep the way Anzaldúa digs deep, the way Moraga, uh, so many of these of these Chicana feminists, they they talk about this digging deep and 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 reaching these painful places where we can visualize differently. Um, and because I, I I work in in the area of literature, um, this is a this is a quote from Anzaldúa, uh, and it regards her poetry. And she says, once the personal experience is transformed into poetry, the I ceases to refer to the historical poem, and the poem becomes a communal artifact, witnessing to all those who see it or hear it, witnessing for those who identify with the experiences it communicates. So it's this idea of transformative powers that, that can be brought to the surface by listening, by witnessing, by encouraging others to in a space safe, in a safe space, have their story heard and feel safe enough to, to, to tell their story. And, and in that way, work towards healing. Um, and, and, and to me, the fact that the working group was given funds by um, um, several, several places shows that as an HSI, we're listening to our students, we're listening to our faculty, we're listening to our staff, and we're, we're working together to make these moves that are necessary um, as our world changes. Um, so uh, yeah, I just, uh, once again, I, I, I want to thank Esther and, and, and Karina for, for, for getting the working group started because it's a, it's a, it's a great starting place and it's, it's, it's the beginning of, of many possible avenues. Um, that, that begin with dialogue and that be, begin with um, a focus on interdisciplinarity and, and, and really listening to both, to, to what students, staff, faculty, um, all of us uh, imagine is necessary to keep tech being the great institution it is in the 21st century. Letty? Did you have anything to add? Um, sure. Um, I think um, both uh, folks have hit on some important aspects here. The HSI, very, very important. I think having taught at various institutions where there is um, a very big town and gown feeling, um, I hope that this group and as a member of this group, I'm willing, since I am, I do the majority of my work in the community of Lubbock, right? I'm not necessarily at Texas Tech. And even when I'm at LCU, I'm only there teaching a couple of classes and I'm right back at the ballet doing something else. I hope that in this group, because we're talking about that communal effect, that deep um, rooted emotional experience um, that Chicanismo gives you, that hopefully we can build ourselves out more into the community as a second step in various ways, um, not just academically. I mean, I love being a member of this group because I can, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm probably gonna send a couple of you snippets of my paper for ATHA, which has to do with Huelga and the borderlands and Farah and El Paso and what those women went through um, during that time period and what that locale looks like, which is totally different with the exception that they were sewing and I sew sometimes uh, from what I do as a costume designer. It's what I do as a researcher, as a Chicana. It's something completely 
um, different and it showcases different areas and aesthetics that I enjoy and I think are very, very important. I just hope that as we progress, we continue to have that intimacy, but also have that extended hand. Because I would hate for tech to be, you know, a Hispanic serving institution that doesn't reach out to Lubbock. I just feel being a part of a particular group here in Lubbock um, that I work with, I feel that there is an insulated venue for everybody, very much a town and gown feeling or a feeling for particular groups of people to only support one type of art or one educational institution. And I think this group using that Chicanismo, that rooted communal um, center has the ability perhaps to break that down a little bit. And I hope that we can um, continue to work together and grow and do that uh, and break some of those barriers down. Cause I think that is a very important thing that a Hispanic serving institution can do. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you everybody. Um, and so our group has, this was our first year um, and we've had hiccups along the way, like most groups do. Uh, but we do hope to grow. We hope that um, by doing this virtual conference that we get the word out and get um, more people interested, more people involved. Um, like what Ina said, uh, we are interdisciplinary. We are, we don't, it, it's for everybody, man, woman, whatever you identify as, you're more than welcome to come. And it's a space where we could come together we can gripe, we can write, we can um, discuss, I don't know, the politics, whatever you want is the space which you, we have it flexible, it's whatever you need it to be. Um, and so we have a few questions. Uh, one question was from Kent Wilkinson. Um, and as you kind of, some of you guys have kind of uh, touched on it. How do you see these ideas connecting to a topic we discussed earlier teaching at an HSI? Britta? Yeah, well, what Dr. Barrera was speaking to earlier really articulated for me what one of the main um, takeaways from participating in this group has been for me in trying to create this space of vulnerability um, and emotional connection with our texts that, that we, we do well in this group, bringing that into the classroom. And I, I think for me, it's also been really a major recognition that um, for so many students reading, it's particularly Hispanic, Chicano, or Latinx students, these, these texts are not just texts, right? And, and actually grappling with them and, and engaging deeply with them can be deeply painful. And I think that part of our responsibility as teachers, um, as professors, is actually making a space for those emotional responses and for the, the slow and sometimes difficult um, process of processing that um, and being respectful of maybe when a student isn't ready to delve into something at that level. Right? Um, so I, I think it has really shifted the types of, of interactions and the types of different formats that I try to create at, as a teacher. Um, different different venues for students to be able to to share their their reactions to what we look at, and just getting that it's personal for everyone, right? Uh, Cordelia, we spoke about this at one of our last meetings. How I I felt that a lot of our uh, young students, especially the younger ones coming in, the freshmen, don't really realize what's out there. What um, that it's whatever we're learning like me as a, as an older, um, getting into this Chicana feminist, I knew about it. I know, I mean, I support it, but I never really identified. I never really sat down and said, I need, you know, I didn't realize that this information that I know is there's more out there. And so if I barely came into my own just more recently, how are these, you know, students knowing, uh, not knowing, you know, that there's these Chicana feminisms that, you know, that they, they can learn and or about our history that's important. If, if I don't know, how are they going to know? If they don't know that it's important to know, if that made sense. Um, 
Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, I think that's a, that's, that's a great point. And that's one of the things that I love about teaching this stuff is that in a class of 20, um, I may have six or seven uh, Mexican Americans or Latinos or Chicanas or what, however it is that that or or even even um, uh, LGBTQI uh, uh, students, anyone who has ever been considered anyone who has ever considered themselves other, and that's anybody, and that's everybody. All kids struggle. They're they're young. They're not sure where very often they come from or where they're headed. And much of what I try to do is get them to see that an understanding of our history, where we come from, regardless of who we are, it's finding what, what speaks to you, where you have been. One text, one, one story, um, can can help a student see that they are not alone. And when they realize that this story, even if it's a story written by an Anglo, this morning I, 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 had, a, I, I had a class and we talked about Larry McMurtry's um, Horseman Pass By. And one of my students was, she, she, she loved it. And she said, I love this because I'm not a young, I'm not a young, kid who's on a ranch, but I understood exactly how this person was being pulled in this direction and in this direction, and I saw my struggle there. So I think that as educators, one of the most important things that we can do is to help students find those stories fictional, non-fictional, poetry, whatever it is, narratives, whatever it is, that speak to them, that speak to where they come from, so as to help them understand who they are and quite possibly how they're going to get to, to be this person that they are meant to be. So it's it's about connecting to those stories. And I didn't I didn't find this stuff until I was in college. I didn't really know it was there either. And I was a lifelong reader as a kid, but again, those 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 books that I had access to were not books that had me or people like me in them. But as a matter of time, that and I found those, it helped me understand who I was. And I have seen so many times my students, when they understand that they are in these stories that that changes that that changes everything for them they, they they realize that they matter yeah if i could jump in real quickly just a a quick antidote i think that goes a bit further even cordelia because i remember i guess it was about five or six years ago i, I teach this course on ethnicity race and gender in media and somehow i had started talking about tony morrison and how much I admired her work and, you know, encouraging students to read some of her books and all. And the uh, African-American student came up to me afterwards and she, she was like freaked out. Like, how does a middle-aged white guy first know who Toni Morrison is? And secondly, you know, connect with that and say, you know, one of his favorite authors and, and all that. And so there was a, a recognition sort of, you know, across some of these uh, categories of, you know, gender, race, age, you know, all of that, um, you know, the power differential between a faculty member and a student that I think were transcended uh, for a moment. And we need to realize that, you know, that can also be going on in, in our classes, particularly as they become more diverse and as, you know, the hopefully the faculty uh, diversifies as well. It, it just occurred to me, um, and I don't know if this is a direction that y'all might want to go in, but you might think about applying uh, for some funding through the Humanities Center, maybe to do some short videos, um, you know, with these perspectives, not necessarily tied to a particular text, but, you know, what you're talking about in terms of voice and in terms of um, that sort of vulnerability and being able to 
find um, you know comfort and strength in sharing ideas with with other people in public that you've held privately or thought maybe were uh, unique to you because I think that could be super useful in terms of you know the mission of the the universities it's moving away from you know primarily uh, white institution toward a more diverse and hopefully you know welcoming and inclusive institution um, to have you know sort of a set of of narratives of stories uh, that could you know, we could point our students to uh, from, a, you know, across different disciplines in the humanities. And I could see it going into to the sciences to STEM as well. I mean, that's not sort of who's represented in this group. But what I'm hearing from you is something similar that I hear from, you know, some uh, Latinas that are working in, you know, engineering or in the hard sciences. And, you know, what is it like? How do you find a voice and use it when you're, you know, one of, you know, one in a hundred, uh, basically. And, you know, the whole issue of, you know, becoming the gender or race representative in that kind of a situation. Um, I think that could be really useful if, if it's something that you all would like to move toward. Yeah, it's a good idea. I, I would just add to the kind of the conversation around this almost universal affective identification with text that I think the counterpoint to that in our teaching is that it's really important that we do highlight the local and the particular to our Latinx community, right? Um, I've learned a lot in this group from Corina about the Chicana um, activism and presence and, and really it's erasure here within Lubbock historically. And, and I can imagine a curriculum that really investigates that erasure as something that could bridge engagement within to the community, right? So I think our responsibility is both presenting texts and finding spaces for students to, to see themselves in identities that might not be their own, but also really elevating and amplifying what is particular about these communities and where we are. Okay, well, let me see. Is there a collection in the Southwest collection that would house that this kind of archive or maybe then Whitfield in the archive for Chicana feminism? Corina, I know that you researched a little bit about this stuff or you've worked in the Southwest and in, in the collections looking for your um, discipline. Did, did you come across any feminism, Chicana feminism stuff in, at, the, at the archive? Um, there is a lot of oral histories that have been put together. There's, um, there was a group called Los Tertulianos that was, um, <clears throat> that was, uh, there was a group called Los Tertulianos, which was uh, student-led, Vidal Aguero, and uh, one of the members there at the Special Collections, um, his name escapes me right now, but he, He's in charge of um, the oral histories, the oral histories um, area, and he was part of that. I mean, he re he's researched closely and did a lot of those oral histories as well. Um, I just read a lot of the Vidal Vidal uh, Aguero papers. A lot of the there was a lot of magazines, um, and there was just so much community involvement. Just like Leti was talking about, um, there was no. A barrier between community and institution and this is you know uh, of course Vidal Aguero broke out and did El Editor and there's a lot of there's just a lot of information that you just I dug up and researched and was fascinated this was such a, such a hub of Chicano activity that I would have never imagined I read about the Menudazo which was a, a Menudo co off you know in Lubbock and it was involved softball and theater and art and it went on for days and I thought that was amazing and I read about marches I read about you know these luminaries coming through um, Rudy Acuna himself was a speaker in I think 1971 because um, <clears throat> The uh, I think it was the fourth or fifth annual La Raza Unida party was held 
or else but Lubbock, Texas, yeah. where they felt it was most critical because of Preston Smith, um, you know, the governor there um, exacting violence, you know, against um, uh, people. And then, you know, they had it there, right, in Lubbock. So I thought that was amazing. And everything I just kept uncovering and uncovering was just, I was like, wow, I would have never thought this. And, you know, it's like, it is a, a history that's getting kind of uh, a little bit, um, drowned out, I want to say, because of a pan Latinidad identity, and there's like this disassociation with such a politically charged word of Chicano or Chicana. Um, and I know you had mentioned like, uh, one of the points that you made to me, Corina, was there was such a, a, a movement and involvement in 1970s and from and then you compared 1970s to our standing now in the present and how there is such a big change where everybody was involved, everybody was, you know, the community was involved and now it's it's like we're barely reaching HSI status, like, you know, however many years later. Um, so um, that's all we had unless there's any other questions or any other comments from our presenters or panelists. I would just close with the, I mean, gratitude towards all of you um, for organizing and for participating. Um, and I mean, something that's really meant something about this group to me is the overt inclusion of feminism within the title and with the mission, within the mission of the group. Um, in my first semester teaching here, real quick, that I, I was discussing with students the, just the term Latinx and what that means. And a student said to me, yeah, but that's a feminist thing, right? Like in a bad way, like as if feminism was a dirty word or something that he didn't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, and so really, I think it is a bold move at this institution at this point to, to center feminist thought. As, as what it means, as, as it's crucial to the discussions within this community. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs>